Thanks, Steve. Okay, good evening, everybody. Um, my name, you probably kind of read, is David M. I'm from Kaspersky Lab. We're an internet security software company. Um, I've, I've taken Run Silent, Run Deep as the kind of theme because it, it's a pretty good metaphor for the way malicious code operates today. So what I'm going to talk about um, is basically the overall sort of threat landscape in summary form, and then we'll move on to kind of some of the aspects um, you know, we'll kind of look at different aspects of that within the overall threat landscape to see what kind of uh, are the main mechanisms that uh, the people that write malicious code are using to get them onto our systems and what the, the impact of that is basically. Um, a little gaze into the crystal ball at what's kind of here now and therefore coming in the immediate future and then a little bit about how um, solutions have developed to combat this problem. Stop me, mine switched on to silent. Um, so I'm going to start by talking about numbers. Um, and basically, in absolute terms, the problem has kind of got bigger uh, just in terms of the numbers. These are records, in other words, signatures in our signature database. And um, in 2007, the number of signatures doubled. We're anticipating that that will double over the course of this year. We, we closed out 2007 with round about 200 and sorry, with about 500,000 signatures in the database. We're already up to about 760,000, um, and we're kind of just a little past Q1. So we're, we're expecting that to come out at about a million by December. Uh, signatures are only one part of the solution, as we'll see later, but it gives you an idea, at least on a, a sort of a regular scale, a constant scale over the last few years of how the problem in numbers has got bigger. Um, just as a snapshot of the type of malware we're seeing, um, this gives a reflection really of the way the motivation has changed over the last five years. Um, really up to about 2004, probably, we were talking largely about cyber vandalism. Um, in other words, people were writing malicious code to challenge each other, challenge themselves, challenge antivirus uh, companies, get their kind of name onto a virus database fame and fortune in a sort of geeky kind of way. What there wasn't at the end of this um, malware rainbow, if you like, was a pot of gold. There was no way they were going to get money at the end of it. Things changed really around about 2003, 4 and we started to see malicious code written specifically in order to make money illegally. And that's kind of reflected. So a lot of the, the malicious code we see now is specifically designed to actually generate revenue. I'll talk more about how in, in a moment. But, uh, so we've moved from computer vandalism, if you like, graffiti, um, right through to um, serious sort of malicious code. Now, it's not that the quality is necessarily um, improved. In some aspects, it has. But there were always people who, who were at the kind of sharp end writing good code. And there was always a kind of mainstream of people who wrote code that wasn't so great. Quality probably is lifted in general. Um, but it's the purpose to which it's put which has changed. And the term crimeware crops up as people try to kind of encapsulate, um, you know, the, the nature of the threat now. Um, so we're seeing kind of stuff written for fraud, uh, people trying to steal confidential data, logins, passwords, credit card information, um, any kind of information that will give people access to a resource and ultimately money um, which belongs to somebody else. Uh, we're seeing unwanted advertising, pop-ups, it could also be spam, traditional spam, um, extortion, downright extortion, in other words, trying to uh, effectively blackmail money out of people. Uh, we're also seeing other types of, of criminal activity cropping up as well. I've put virtual property theft. More and more people are doing stuff online, more and more people are playing games online, um, and basically the resources or the property which people build up through their character online actually has a, a tag in the real world, a price tag associated with it. And although in many cases it's not legitimate to kind of sell that property in the real world, people do do it and it fetches quite a bit of money. So you can make money illegally from that by stealing people's credentials to the game, uh, assuming their identity and then flogging their, their virtual property. And you get some pretty bad um, situations. I mean, an example, and it's really at the far end of this. About uh, two years ago, there was somebody got killed as a result of this because he'd spent a long time building up his character in one of the online games. I can't remember which one. Um, somebody basically stole his 
online credentials, stole his valuable online property, and in retaliation he took a sword to somebody when he found out who it was. Uh, I mean, obviously that's, that's not the typical kind of crime that is perpetrated as a result of this. It's normally financial, but, you know, it's kind of at the extreme end. Um, if give a, a sort of insight into the virus threat today, and I, I've deliberately put that in inverted commas because although people talk about the virus threat, actually day in, day out, we don't see many viruses these days. Most of what we see are Trojans of one kind or another, and there's a very differentiated market in Trojans. Um, they perform different functions, um, and, and uh, they're purpose-built for specific activities online. About 5% of the threats we see now are viruses and worms. About 5% fall into the category of potentially unwanted applications, um, and probably 90, 91% fall into the category of Trojan. Um, so this is from Virus Watch, and Virus Watch is something we have on our website, which gives a real-time view into what the guys in the lab are analyzing day in, day out. I took this last week. Um, I mean, I take this when I do different talks at a different snapshot in time, and it comes up the same way, more or less, which is mostly Trojans, some stuff which is kind of adware or riskware, uh, and occasionally you get the virus or worm thrown in as well. So if, if that's why people are writing, and that's the kind of stuff, broadly speaking, they're writing. What about where? Who's writing it? Well, the top source of malicious code we're seeing right now is China. About 55% of what we get into the lab now originates in China. Latin America is a big um, hotbed, particularly for banking Trojans, malicious code designed to, to steal bank information. Um, we're seeing stuff coming out of Russia and Eastern Europe, and that specifically has a, um, a botnet aspect to it. So in other words, these guys are writing the code which allows people to control herds of compromised machines and control collectively what those machines are doing. Um, so that's, that's kind of how it works. Now, I've made the reference to the legitimate economy um, just because that there's a danger, I guess, some things you hear, hear or read about in the press would indicate that there's a sort of um, a global uh, structure to the way this criminal activity works. You know, you've got some Blofeld or Dr. No character pulling all the strings, and it's not like that. The model really is like the legitimate economy, which is you have lots of different people doing lots of different things, and in many ways, even competing with each other. Um, but there's an interdependence as well. For example, if somebody can or somebody wants to spam uh, you know advertise their their goods and services then clearly there's a market for stolen email addresses so if I steal email addresses I know I can sell them on to somebody else that wants to deliver spam it's that kind of interdependence rather than a structural dependence on each other that we're talking about so it's crime which is organized rather than organized crime which conjures up the images of the mob and, and all the rest of it. So these people are getting organized because they know there's money out there. But they're organized in the same way that people are who steal cars, people who um, you know, will, will do sort of mass theft from retail stores and so on. Um, we've seen very few global epidemics in the last few years. Um, if you think back to 2003, there was epidemic after epidemic after epidemic. Hardly a month went by when there weren't two or three big hitting threats. Normally worms, which were mass mailed out to people, you know, so that they gather email addresses from my machine and then flood those people with, with the worm and pick addresses off their machine. And so it goes on like some chain reaction. Well, we don't see that anymore. <clears throat> and really that's the parallel to the change in motivation is the change in tactic. What they're doing now is not really geared towards mass distribution of worms. We, you know, wave the big flag and say, hey, how clever am I? I created this and it went global in hours or minutes. What they're looking to do now is to stay fairly low key, um, not draw attention to themselves, because the ego trip, if you like, the fame of fortune is not what they're after at all. They want anonymity because they want to kind of pick our pockets effectively. So they're less visible to, to people like us because we have our network of malware traps, so-called honeypots, out there on the internet, capturing internet traffic, capturing emails, uh, looking at um, websites for malicious code and so on. So if, if they remain low-key, they're less visible to us. Uh, they're less visible to police agencies 
and agencies in this country, in the States, in Canada, in Australia, um, in, in Eastern Europe and Russia are far more experienced than they've ever been before and they do cooperate with each other as well in order to um, pursue these cyber criminals. So again, stay low key, less risk of, of having your collar felt effectively. Um, it also means that they, the machines out there that get infected or get attacked are more manageable. Um, if you want fame and fortune, then hit as many machines as you can as fast as possible. <clears throat> if what you want to do is steal, let's say, credit card information, then if you have too many infected machines, you, you can't process the information in a timely fashion. And your window of opportunity for processing that information before a card gets cancelled, for example, you know, shrinks and you've wasted your time. So it's much better to actually um, use your network of compromised machines to, to do stuff small scale and then move on to other machines and so on. So there's the kind of ebb and flow of activity, but not necessarily the, the big hit that you used to get with my doom and so big and, and bagel and these, these types of threats. Um, they're serious in the sense also that they will try and counter um, security programs. They will try to undermine them. They'll try and rip the code out to stop them updating and that kind of stuff. And they will even compete with each other. Um, even going to the lengths of using antivirus programs when they install to have a look on the system and see if there's any competing malware there that they can pull out first of all because they want to own the territory that they've just kind of reached out and touched. Um, attacks broadly speaking, well, we're seeing spam mailings. Instead of mass mailings which kind of rip through the internet on stolen email addresses, we're now seeing deliberate spammings to a finite list of people. So the, the Trojan doesn't have any built-in replication mechanism. It's, it's, in many cases today, spammed out there directly. Um, increasingly, though, we are seeing web-based um, threats as well, and, and so-called drive-by downloads. You go visit a web page, you get infected automatically. Um, we're seeing Trojans, as I say, 90-odd percent of what we see are Trojans many with a spyware component, uh, many geared towards ID theft, many of them controlled in these large um, compromised networks of machines. And of course, phishing attacks um, you know, continue to, to be a big problem as well. No, no sign of that slackening off right now. So Trojans, well, look, the concept of the Trojan comes from the Greek myth. It, it looks like something benign. Um, but actually it's got a hidden agenda. There's something inside it which is going to do something bad. And before the mass use of the internet, both for personal use and for business, Trojans really weren't a big problem. Um, they represented probably less than 1% of the threat 10, 12, 15 years ago. Why are they so big now? Well, because you don't need to spread your Trojan like you did your virus or worm. All you need to do is secrete it somewhere on the internet, get enough hits or whatever that resource is, and you've effectively spread it using the, the, the capabilities of the internet to do it. Um, we see lots of different kinds, as I mentioned earlier. I've highlighted in red the ones that are particularly focused on gathering information. Um, so backdoors, as the name suggests, is designed to create um, a backdoor on the system, open up a port on, on the machine, and route traffic, route information that's being gathered by the Trojan on the machine out to the master of that Trojan or the Trojan botnet. Uh, we see password stealing and, and Trojan spies, as the name suggests, designed to gather password information. Uh, droppers and downloaders, ways of getting a Trojan onto a machine in the first place. And I have to say that part of the reason for the big growth in numbers uh, and that escalation, particularly in the co last couple of years, is because we're seeing more threats with a shorter shelf life. Quite often now we won't see threats which have a a life of months or six months or a year, we'll see them which you know, threats which have a life of maybe a week, sometimes even less. Um, and then a new threat will come out and uh, that gets used by the bad guys for whatever purpose they want to do as well. So there's this kind of cycle of more and more threats. Uh, the old ones are expired or retired a lot earlier than they used to be. And the downloader, as an example then, will be used to rejuvenate that malicious code. So you ship your Trojan, first of all, with a downloading component built into it. Once it hits that victim machine, uh, you can carry out whatever activity you're going to with the Trojan. Then in a week's time, 
all you do is point it at a particular website which is coded into the Trojan and it downloads an update for itself and so the cycle continues. Uh, Trojan proxies, well they, they function in, in two main ways really. One is they're acting as a substitute for the criminal, um, so useful spam distribution for example, used for conducting denial of service attacks which are used to then extort money from organizations. Um, or they're also used for anonymity because if my machine is compromised and I've got a, a, a Trojan proxy on my machine, any malicious activity routes back to me, not back to whoever is controlling this machine. Um, spyware is it, it's really a fuzzy term that's developed over the last few years. Um, it's not really a technical term like you could have a copybook definition of virus and worm and trojan, but for spyware it's a lot fuzzier than that. And really it's a bit of a catch-all term for threats which have been around for quite a long time. But the main thrust uh, of this term when, when people use it is that it's going to gather information or track what you're doing on the system. And it really covers everything from the out-and-out -out malicious, the stuff we've been tracking for 10 years or more, password stealing trojans for example, uh, right through to stuff which is in the kind of grey zone, um, you know, adware programs which let's say the adware is built into some free download and you accept through some user agreement that you never read um, that you get the adware along with a free program. Um, you can't rip out the adware without ripping out the free program because they're kind of linked into each other through the registry and so on. Um, so the sort of greyware stuff, and I say greyware because if people are signing up for some activity, then you can't necessarily say that it's out and out malicious. Um, and then right through to riskware stuff. And riskware is st something which of itself may be not malicious, but it could be used for malicious purposes. I'm thinking here of crackers. Um, I'm thinking also of remote admin type tools, which you know may have a legitimate use. But of course, if um, an enterprise IT manager finds that everybody in the company is using that remote admin tool to kind of sneak a look at what other people are doing, then it's no longer a benign thing. And so people want detection for it. So we have this category riskware, which allows detection of potentially unwanted applications. And you've got to be really careful with that. You can't just say they're malicious because otherwise somebody will turn around and try and sue you. And there have been several cases where um, antivirus vendors have been sued by different organizations for labeling their particular application as malicious or, or risky or, or whatever else you're going to say. Um, so potential impact of this stuff, uh, and as I say, much of it is, is Trojan activity. Well, data loss, obviously, privacy issues, bandwidth issues, potentially HR and legal issues too, because if there's content on the machine which ought not to be there, then that's an HR issue too. Uh, bandwidth loss, obviously, and then system instability, because this thing may be plugging into your web browser, so it may affect the stability of that application. It may be that you can't remove the program because there's no feature in add remove programs to pull it out again. So all kinds of, of, of issues. Not, none of them related to what the old payload of, of viruses in the 90s would be, which was corrupt your data, trash the disk, and that kind of stuff. These guys have an interest in my uptime, just like I do. Um, botnets, well, the, the term obviously comes from robot, uh, and it, it's, it's um, networks of compromised machines which are controlled through some channel. And traditionally, this was IRC channels. These days, it could be IM, instant messaging channels. It could also be um, through a website. Uh, but the idea behind it is that, that your backdoor or, or whatever Trojan program you've got on your machine has the capability built into it, if you like, to phone home. Um, in other words, to connect back to whoever is controlling or whoever distributed it in the first place. And they will use um, management consoles to actually control the flow of activity, to look at the performance of their network. Um, they'll use it to control different parts of it for different functions, maybe denial of service. I said earlier on about extortion attempts. Um, two years ago or so, uh, there were some organizations in this country, online gaming organizations, that were subject to attack uh, in a denial of service attack. But basically what these guys did was to flood the websites with traffic and then basically contact these agencies and say, you'll get more of the same unless you pay us some money. And they were 
pulling in about 55 grand a week at one stage. Um, I have to say that there's now six of them doing time in, in Russia for this joint operation between authorities here and those in Russia managed to, to catch up with the perpetrators. Um, so, so sometimes these things are called zombie armies. Obviously, you know, you, you've got the, the living dead, so to speak. You don't know that you've been compromised. Uh, your machine is being controlled, but you don't know it. Um, often, and typically, in fact, in the past, really, up until fairly recently, these were organized through a central control and command console, basically. Um, now, that gave a glimmer of hope, really, because it meant that apart from detecting all of this stuff, we could also work with police agencies and work with ISPs to take a particular server down, take it off the internet if we were able to locate it. What we've seen more recently, though, is these guys pursue a distributed model. Um, gelatine is our name for the stormworm, if you've seen references to that over the last 12 months. Stormworm turned up um, in January last year, and it has adopted this sort of peer-to-peer -peer model. Um, in other words, there's no central server controlling every compromised machine. There are several of them dotted all around the internet. Um, I mean, lots of them, but you know, not every machine knows about every center. Every, every uh, center is concealed from some of the machines out there. Um, a bit like a spy network, you know, where perhaps two or three of the agents um, are known to one person but no one agent knows everybody in the network. It's that sort of concept, which means that you can't take it down. And, and that really explains the persistence, if you like, of the storm worm um, over the last 12 months or so. And it's been used for different purposes uh, at different points in the, in the year. More recently, the Mayday Trojan has used a similar model. And of course, because this is more successful, it's likely that this will be copied again in the future. Um, this kind of gives a an insight into some of the stuff. This is from um, the, the storm worm and gives you kind of the, the sort of management view that the uh, the botnet controller might get of the system. And you can see that they kind of, you know, they can, they can pull in stats by country. They can look at operating systems or browsers um, and get a whole range of stuff. And they're looking at the, the relative efficiencies of this um, so that they can kind of control the activity. So they can get pretty granular information. Um, and this is not unique, this is kind of fairly standard stuff for most of these botnets. Um, we've seen increasing numbers of threats specifically targeting banks. And I'm not talking here about something like the Sumitomo bank operation, where they were trying to use a Trojan to steal money from the bank. That's about 230 million, I think, if, if they'd been successful, that they were apprehended. I'm not talking about an attack on the bank as an institution. I'm talking about an attack on you and me as a way of getting our money which we have banked with whatever banking agency it is. And the traditional way of doing this was through a phishing attack. So you send an email out. The email looks like it's come from the bank or from eBay or PayPal. And um, there's a link in there. And the typical spoof is, well, you know, what we're trying to do is um, we're, we're doing a bit of back-end management, tidying up. We need you to reconfirm your login and password details or your PIN number. So click on the link key your details in. Unfortunately, it doesn't go to yourbank.com. It goes to yourlocalcriminal.com. And it looks like your bank. And of course, you're keying your information. Or some unsuspecting people will key in the information. And it's the criminals who've got that data. And they can then use it to log into your bank. So that's the typical way of doing it. Um, these guys are no different to any sort of criminals. They'll go after the low-hanging fruit while that continues to be productive. And so this stuff, you know, still works. There are still significant numbers of people who will, um, you know, fall for such scams because not everybody is tech savvy, of course. And two, about a third of the people in this country right now bank online. Um, and I think APAX, the, 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 that coordinate the sort of banks, uh, it's the bank clearinghouse, estimate that about five billion was spent online in December alone. So there's huge amounts of money being moved around in one way or another. And that's what these guys are after. So even if most of what they do doesn't work, there's significant returns for them. Well, examples would be this targeting. I think this was a, a PayPal one. 
So it all kind of looks looks pretty credible. Uh, it's not like you know five years ago where you could see through obvious typos. I mean, there are typos in this stuff, but they're getting better at it. Um, one targeting HSBC, um, and again, you see same look and style as as HSBC itself. They will steal the logo and use that. Um, they will even in so-called spear phishing attempts. They will even target individuals. Um, you know, within an organization. Uh, so what they will do is that they'll start to sort of speculate that there's probably going to be somebody called John in an organization, you know, this thisorganization.com, and they'll say, I'm from the IT department, need to check your login, hand it over. And you say, oh, okay, John from the IT department, and there's the logo, so you type it in, and guess what, somebody's got the network login, and on they go and build up this bank of information. So it's not just individuals. Um, this one was targeting eBay, and again, the same sort of idea. It looks very like it could be an, e an eBay email, even though, you know, banks increasingly now are uh, steering clear of email as a form of communication, but that's good practice rather than any kind of written down rule as, as such. Um, the sort of next level, if you like, is, is technical engineering rather than social engineering. So. You know, let's not try and get the user to um, do something they ought not to do. Let's actually plant some software on the machine which will do that redirection to a spoof website automatically by modifying DNS information on the local machine, by modifying the host file, by installing a, a browser helper object. Um, you know, so this DLLs that get activated automatically when you load your browser. And then you know, and this is not mainstream right now, but it's certainly, if you like, at the, the kind of leading edge of where these guys are, is sort of man-in-the-middle attacks, or, or man-in-the-browser, or man-in-the-endpoint attacks. Uh, the idea here is to try and combat two-factor authentication. So as you know, banks are starting now to look at something other than a static password when you log into your bank. They're issuing card readers or they're issuing tokens which give a, a, a password which changes every minute which you use with your static password so that even if somebody steals your credentials it's no good to them in a minute's time once you've, you've finished that transaction. Um, so what, they, what are they doing here to combat that? Well these guys will put code on your machine again um, but instead of trying to just steal the credentials and use them later what they're trying to do is set themselves up as a proxy in the transaction that you've initiated with your bank. So what happens is you, you go to your bank's website and the Trojan on your machine redirects that search to the fake website controlled by the cyber criminal. Um, the cyber criminal then basically acts as a go-between, gets your personal information, uses it to log into the real site, but they piggyback the transaction. Now as I say, this is still not um, you know, mainstream, but it gives you an idea of the, the non-low hanging fruit so that, you know, let's say overnight phishing scams, the basic phishing scam becomes defunct, this is the sort of direction they'll move in. Um, and then I, I guess at a slightly different tack you've got DNS cache poisoning and this is where they're targeting specifically vulnerable DNS servers and looking to put fake information in the cache stored on that server so that it's feeding up fake um, websites in return for searches that are being conducted. Um, we're also seeing, I mean, I've talked about the, the kind of high level extortion on big organizations. Ransomware is the name we give to the sort of um, the small scale uh, extortion or blackmail attempts. This is aimed really not at big corporations but really at individuals or small businesses. Um, the idea is you deliver your malicious code onto that machine either spam it to them or it could be a, an email worm. But once it's on the machine, it encrypts the data on the machine. Um, having encrypted the data, it also writes a readme file, typically into every folder, and the readme basically will say, you know, give me some money. Um, so something like that. Um, instructions to get your files back, read it carefully. If you don't understand, read it again. Uh, and You can kind of read that for yourself, but the idea is you need to contact us and we will tell you how to wire some money to us. And it could be five pounds, it could be two thousand pounds. We've seen various um, numbers between those ranges. 
um, and various methods used. The, the ones we tend to see in Eastern Europe and Russia tend to use um, encryption proper, RSA, uh, or attempts to implement RSA, not, not necessarily great attempts to do it, uh, even as high as try and, trying 660-bit encryption. Um, in the West, stuff that's targeted here, the US, Germany, tends to be zip files with very long passwords. But either way, they're trying to, to achieve this. Um, now, if this is targeted at me um, as an individual employee within Kaspersky Lab, of course, I'm going to say, well, A, I've got my backup, and B, I'm just going to get IT to reinstall the operating system and all the applications, and who cares? You know, let's get rid of the, the, the software, the malicious software that's on there, and I can move on. But if I'm an individual or a small business, maybe that's not the case, and maybe, you know, paying... 50 pounds might be actually worthwhile. Um, so far, I have to say, uh, attempts at doing this, we've been able to not only remove the malicious code, but decrypt the data as well, because it's not particularly well implemented. Um, that may not always be the case, of course, so backups are really important. Um, we have seen an increasing number in the last two years, particularly, of web-based attacks. Um, this is where, basically, somebody will target a server, and it could be a server they host themselves, um, you know, a malicious server or one controlled directly by these guys. It could be a legitimate server and more often than not it will be a legitimate resource and they're hijacking it. They're looking for a vulnerability and they're planting code on the server and they're using that code to deliver typically a Trojan onto the machine of a passerby, hence the term drive-by download. So th this will often form, um, take the form of script let's say JavaScript or Visual Basic script, um, they will quite often encrypt it on the website. Um, you go to the page, you browse to it, you get the content you want displayed, you don't know anything else has happened, but what's happened is that behind the HTML, the JavaScript has executed and decrypted itself and put a, a Trojan onto your machine, which then can carry on functioning in all the ways I've mentioned earlier. Um, one example, uh, MPAC, um, there are others. Um, MPAC sort of got a bit of notoriety in the middle of yes, last year because there were lots and lots and lots of Italian sites in particular targeted by this thing. Uh, MPAC was written by Russian hackers. They used it but also sold it on to others because that's two ways of making money, right? You can actually target victims directly but you can also hire out your, your um, malicious code to other people who maybe haven't got the technical expertise to write their own, or maybe don't want to get involved with the labor of doing that. It's better for them, more cost effective just to rent somebody else's facilities. Well, MPAC was one of these exploit bundles. Um, and uh, it was there were exploits in there for IE, uh, Internet Explorer, for Firefox, for WinZip, a whole range of applications. And, and whichever one was applicable would kick in. So the idea is you go up to a website which has been compromised, you read the content, the script executes, uh, and will use whatever application you've got which is vulnerable to get code onto your machine. You close the browser, you carry on working, you now have a Trojan on your system. Um, they will use stealth to conceal themselves because you know the longer they can stay in business, the more money they make. Um, so they will quite often use packers, and there are thousands and thousands and thousands of different types of packer. Some legitimate, many, many legitimate ones, used to kind of shrink code on the disk and make a download less time-consuming. Um, but these guys will use uh, packing techniques or write their own in order to make it harder for analysts to look at their code and therefore extend the shelf life of their product. So they will pack it with a different packer, uh, they will pack it several times, um, and so it goes on. So they can squeeze more life out of what they've written. Um, increasingly, Trojans now come with rootkit technology built in. The concept of the rootkit is borrowed from the Unix world. The idea is that you get root privileges to the system, um, unknown to the real administrator. What we're talking about under Windows really is a way of subverting uh, communication between an application and the kernel. Uh, so it's monitoring kind of um, requests that are made and the information returned to the application and falsifying the information. Uh, the, the concept is as old as the PC virus itself, 
Uh, it's just in those days they were doing it for DOS, now they're doing it for Windows. Um, so what are they trying to conceal? Well, of course, if you've created a Trojan and installed it, there are going to be files, installation files. There are going to be the actual executables, maybe DLLs belonging to the Trojan. There are going to be registry edits. There's going to be activity, maybe, which you can see through Task Manager. Um, so it, it, they will try and conceal all of this activity so that the user doesn't notice what's happening. So more and more of them are doing that. Of course, it's, it's, um, it's productive because people don't see what's going on. It's productive because that gives, again, their, their code a greater shelf life. It also makes it harder to not only find this stuff, but, but pull it out of the system as well, because by definition, it's installed fairly low level. What we haven't seen yet, other than kind of in theoretical papers at, um, at conferences, is the idea of some sort of rootkit that stands outside the operating system at, at a sort of firmware level. Um, and these are the sorts of things that researchers scare each other with, but th th at this stage, they're not reality. It, although, funnily enough, we've started to see an extension of rootkit um, type activity. I mean, anyone that's been around as long as I have might remember boot sector viruses. Um, they, they infected floppy disks, the main mechanism for transmitting data, up to about 12 years ago or whatever. Um, until about 96, these were about 70% of the problem that we had to deal with. Um, well, we don't use floppy disks very much now. Um, but that concept of infecting at a low level has started to come back. And we've got stuff which we call boot kits. And the idea is that it, they're not using it to spread to removable media, although that's entirely possible. What they're doing is installing it as an additional component. So there's an IEM component, there's a worm, there's a Trojan, there's downloader capability. Um, and on top of it, they're installing a rootkit at boot up time. So they're putting their code onto the master boot record, the first sector that gets loaded after the BIOS has done all of its processing. And by doing that, they get in before the operating system and before, obviously, an antivirus program. Again, this is not a mainstream technique, but it shows you kind of how the bad guys are trying to up the ante, if you like. Uh, polymorphism really means how can we vary the code with each infection so that you can't just have a standard signature for finding every sample. You have to do some other stuff on top of that. Well, the sort of latest reinvention or reincarnation of polymorphism is so-called server-side polymorphism. And this is where, let's say you've got some code on a website, you also stick a morphing engine at the back of it, and you recompile the code um, at intervals during the week or even during the day. We've seen some which will recompile every hour. But the idea is you recompile it with kind of no operation instructions at various points in the code so that the shape of the compiled code looks different. So a simple signature, again, is not enough. Um, I mentioned earlier that these guys will try and sabotage security programs. I call this anti-antivirus. Uh, they will stop security processes if they can. They will remove code. Uh, sometimes a bit more subtle, they will try and um, stop the security program from getting out onto the internet to update itself. Again, that's easy to do. If you modify the host's file, you can kind of stop that, that access to that site. Uh, they'll even suppress error messages. Again, that's not a mainstream activity, but some of the ones at the cutting edge are doing this. So your firewall would pop up and say, do you want to accept this activity? But something clicked OK on your behalf and suppressed the message. Um, and again, they will even compete with each other. And the, the sort of most uh, determined example of this kind of um, sabotage that I've seen really was a couple of years ago, we saw a Trojan called Spam Through. And Spam Through... Um, basically made use of a hacked version of our own uh, scanner, uh, which it pulled down off some pirate website and used that to scan on the machine to see if other Trojans were installed. Again, that's not necessarily mainstream activity, but it, it's at the kind of leading edge of what they're doing to try and uh, maintain their supremacy on a victim machine. The damage tends to be subtle and insidious. There's no sort of big bang like there was with Michelangelo or uh, one half on NATO, so all those viruses from the 90s. What happens now, really, is that your machine stays up and everything looks good, um, but behind the scenes, it's data. Uh, 
they don't want to destroy the data, they want to gather and use that data. So future prospects, well we're already seeing auto generation of malware through that sort of server side polymorphism that we're seeing through the use of Trojan downloaders, that's going to continue. Uh, you know, if there's Web 2.0 there's got to be Malware 2.0, right? Um, so what's in Malware 2.0, the next generation if you will? Well we're seeing hybrid threats, threats with multiple components. We're seeing threats which are based around distributed botnet activity rather than a single central and, um, command center. Um, different distribution methods, self-protection techniques, um, boot kits, as I mentioned, as an extension of the roots kit concept to dumping code on the on the MBR or the boot sector. We are seeing some file virus activity, and particularly targeted at uh, online gaming, and lots and lots of this in the Far East and in China in particular. Um, we will continue to see the use of exploits because it works for these guys, um, and. I guess social networking is also starting to be targeted. We've seen, for example, people trying to spam within Facebook or Bebo where they will kind of try to send something from profile to profile. So they're doing it at the server end rather than at the, the client end. Um, clearly the, the biggest issue right now in terms of social networking sites is the fact that we all have lots and lots of things we log into and the more things we have, the more passwords we need and the more pressure on us is to remember them or to use the same ones or to recycle them. David 1, David 2, David 3. The danger is somebody gets one set of credentials, they can then reuse that across different resources once they've kind of got a bit of a profile about us. And the reason I'm on Facebook, let's say, and I'm not, by the way, but um, is because I want to share information and I want to contact people and I want to network. So I come to it predisposed to, to cough up information about myself which you know, maybe I don't realize is going to be used by people. Um, again, what we haven't seen, but it, it's, it's, it's certainly a possibility, is people trying, rather than putting code on the endpoint device, to actually look for some vulnerability on the server, which is hosting one of these social networking sites, and use that as a means of propagating their code through profiles as people log in. So you log in, and it does whatever it's going to do at the server end, if you like. Um, mobile threats, uh, you know, they're not a huge problem. We are seeing mobile threats, and they're quite sophisticated. We're just not seeing them in big numbers. Um, so they're not a major problem in that sense, but of course more and more of us are using smart devices, and before long we will start to use them for moving money around and for doing financial stuff. Um, as we do, they pose a bigger target. So, you know, when are they going to be a big threat, if at all? Well, it's a guess, but I mean, I would say sometime probably within the next two to five years, we'll start to see it being a serious issue. In the meantime, of course, it's not just a virus or a potential virus problem on a device like that. There's a the problem that I'm storing data on it, which somebody else might want to use, and therefore the device might get stolen or I might lose it, and people can tap into it and get that information out. Um, so, the things that will kind of affect it, well, one is connectivity. You know, we don't really have eat as much as you like mobile connectivity right now, like we do with, say, home broadband. But when we do, then we'll be more inclined to do stuff online through our smartphone. Um, there's lots of OSs out there, lots of operating systems. You know, you've got the iPhone, you've got the BlackBerry, you've got Symbian, you've got Windows Mobile. Uh, to date, most of what we've seen is targeted Symbian with some stuff for Windows Mobile, um, you know, but there's still some sort of shaking up of stuff to, to happen because while you have a fragmented um, operating system environment or, or landscape, if you like, it means that the, anyone targeting a device like that is only going to hit 25% of people, whereas, let's face it, if you, if you write something for Windows, you're going to hit a big, big percentage higher than 25%. Than so, you know, if we get down to a point where we have less operating systems, it's a bigger target for these guys. Um, so, okay, that's, that, that kind of paints a picture of, of the threat. What about solutions to the problem? Well, the traditional solution is antivirus. Um, and, again, it's, it's often kind of looked at as signature-based. You know, you, you find some piece of code within um, the virus or Trojan, 
um, which always identifies it. It's always in that Trojan, it's always in that location. Put it into your database and it gives you something to scan for, a, a scan sequence or signature. Well, that's never totally been th th the whole solution. As far back as 91, 92, when the first polymorphic viruses arrived, we had to start using emulation techniques. We had to start doing some fairly hefty code analysis. So signatures were never the whole solution, but now, less than ever, um, there are big benefits to having signatures. One is it doesn't require as much use or as much input from the user because you say I found this, I found it here, this is what it is, this is the name it's got, you can look up the details whereas with perhaps more generic methods it's kind of like well I've noticed this activity are you happy about it? Could be malicious but on the other hand could be legitimate and people have more input to bring to the table in that case but anyway how, how are things sort of emerge because although we talk about AV or antivirus it's much bigger than that now because typically these programs will include emulation techniques typically they will include heuristic analysis or generic signature detection where you target whole families of viruses using a single signature that's more efficient for one thing but it also gives you some proactive capabilities um, firewall and intrusion detection um, is quite often built into to packages now, as indeed are you know, host intrusion prevention. I'm thinking here of, of stuff like um, sandboxing type technology where you, you run code in a protected sandbox, a virtual environment. You see how it would behave if you let it loose on the real machine and if it's malicious you don't let it run on the real machine. Um, and also behavioral analysis, real-time behavioral analysis. So you track what the code is doing and if you determine that it's a bad thing, you stop it and roll it back. Um, and then whitelisting, the, the idea of coming at this not from the blacklist end of it's a bad thing or maybe a bad thing, but if it's legitimate, let it run. If it's not on the list, don't let it run. Or you blend the two. And, and in terms of broad um, development eras, if you like, the, the, there was the sort of signature based or mainly signature based era of the antivirus. What really happened I guess around about 2002 or 3 was the introduction of firewalls, the introduction of anti-spam and other capabilities um, which had existed before but never been brought into um, the use of detecting malicious code really. Um, so that was that sort of era where you, you have multiple products in a, an overall suite but on the whole they're operating pretty independently and I think we're starting to move into an area now where these are going to be implemented in a smart way um, and what I mean by that is you don't want to add layer after layer of, of product you know your anti-spam your firewall your behavioral your whitelisting so you get thick layers of paint built up to protect the pipe what you want if you like is, is to blend a smart paint which is one coat protects against all and as an example of that, what I'm thinking of here is if you think of a flowchart, you know, so the data, raw data comes in at one end of the flowchart and you see if it's on the whitelist. If it's on the whitelist, you don't need to do anything else. It's a good program, we know it is. So you don't need to do all of this funky behavioral analysis or sandboxing, which is more processor intensive. If, on the other hand, it's not on the whitelist, then is it a known bad thing? Yes, it is. Great. You drop out of the flowchart and you save some more effort. If not, you know, then you start to apply some of the other stuff. So instead of doing it, uh, you know, if you like, in series, um, you're kind of processing it in a smart way. So that's the kind of area we're, we're into at the moment. Um, at that point, thank you for your attention. Um, we're going to open it up for questions, and then we'll do the, the draw. So it's a bit of a roller coaster, steamrolled through it, but hopefully it's been of use. But has anyone got any questions? <laughs>